Section 5 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Teresa. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Wild Swans Far away, where the swallows take refuge in winter, lived a king who had eleven sons and one daughter, Elise. The eleven brothers, they were all princes, used to go to school with stars on their breasts and swords at their sides. They wrote upon golden slates with diamond pencils, and they could read just as well without a book as with one, so there was no mistake about their being real princes. Their sister, Elise, sat upon a little footstool of looking-glass, and she had a picture-book, which had cost the half of a kingdom. Oh, these children were very happy, but it was not to last thus forever. Their father, who was king over all the land, married a wicked queen, who was not at all kind to the poor children. They found that out on the first day. All was festive at the castle, but when the children wanted to play at having company, instead of giving them cakes and baked apples as ever they wanted, she only let them have some sand in a teacup, and said they must make believe. In the following week, she sent little Elise into the country to board with some peasants, and it did not take her long to make the king believe so many bad things about the boys that he cared no more about them. "'Fly out into the world and look after yourselves,' said the wicked queen. "'You shall fly about like birds without voices.' <laughs> but she could not make things as bad for them as she would have liked. They turned into eleven beautiful swans. They flew out of the palace window with a weird scream, right across the park and the woods. It was very early in the morning when they came to the place where their sister was sleeping in the peasant's house. They hovered over the roof of the house, turning and twisting their long necks and flapping their wings but no one either heard or saw them. They had to fly away again, and they soared up towards the clouds, far out into the wide world, and they settled in a big, dark wood which stretched down to the shore. Poor little Elise stood in the peasant's room, playing with a green leaf, for she had no other toys. She made a little hole in it, which she looked through at the sun and it seemed to her as if she saw her brother's bright eyes every time the warm sunbeams shone upon her cheek. It reminded her of their kisses. One day passed just like another. When the wind whistled through the rose hedges outside the house, it whispered to the roses, Who can be prettier than you are? But the roses shook their heads and answered, Elise. And when the old woman sat in the doorway reading her psalms, the wind turned over the leaves and said to the book, Who can be more pious than you? Elise, answered the book. Both the roses and the book of psalms only spoke the truth. She was to go home when she was fifteen. But when the queen saw how pretty she was, she got very angry, and her heart was filled with hatred. She would willingly have turned her into a wild swan, too, like her brothers. But she did not dare to do it at once, for the king wanted to see his daughter. The queen always went to the bath in the early morning. It was built of marble and adorned with soft cushions and beautiful carpets. She took three toads, kissed them, and said to the first, 
sit upon Elise's head when she comes to the bath, so that she may become sluggish like yourself. Sit upon her forehead, she said to the second, that she may become ugly like you, and then her father won't know her. <laughs> Rest upon her heart, she whispered to the third. Let an evil spirit come over her, which may be a burden to her. Then she put the toads into the clean water, and a green tinge immediately came over it. She called Elise, undressed her, and made her go into the bath. When she ducked under the water, one of the toads got among her hair, the other got onto her forehead, and the third onto her bosom. But when she stood up, three scarlet poppies floated on the water. Had not the creatures been poisonous and kissed by the sorceress, they would have been changed into crimson roses. But yet, they became flowers from merely having rested a moment on her head and her heart. She was far too good and innocent for the sorcery to have any power over her. When the wicked queen saw this, she rubbed her over with walnut juice and smeared her face with some evil-smelling salve. She also matted up her beautiful hair. It would have been impossible to recognize pretty Elise. When her father saw her, he was quite horrified and said that she could not be his daughter. Nobody would have anything to say to her except the yard dogs and the swallows, and they were only poor dumb animals whose opinion went for nothing. Poor Elise wept, and thought of her eleven brothers who were all lost. She crept sadly out of the palace, and wandered about all day, over meadows and marshes, and into a big forest. She did not know in the least where she wanted to go, but she felt very sad and longed for her brothers, who, no doubt, like herself, had been driven out of the palace. She made up her mind to go and look for them, but she had only been in the wood a short while when night fell. She had quite lost her way, so she lay down upon the soft mass, said her evening prayer, and rested her head on a little hillock. It was very still, and the air was mild. Hundreds of glowworms shone around her on the grass, and in the marsh like green fire. When she gently moved one of the branches over her head, the little shining insects fell over her like a shower of stars. She dreamt about her brothers all night long. Again they were children, playing together. They rode upon their golden slates with their diamond pencils and she looked at the picture book which had cost half a kingdom. But they no longer wrote strokes and knots upon their slates, as they used to do. No, they wrote down all their boldest exploits and everything they had seen and experienced. Everything in the picture book was alive. The birds sang, and the people walked out of the books and spoke to Elise and her brothers. When she turned over a page, they skipped back into their places again so that there would be no confusion among the pictures. When she woke, the sun was already high. It is true, she did not see it very well through the thick branches of the lofty forest trees. But the sunbeams cast a golden shimmer around beyond the forest. There was a fresh, delicious scent of grass and herbs in the air, and the birds were almost ready to perch on her shoulders. She could hear the splashing of water, for there were many springs around, which all flowed into a pond with a lovely sandy bottom. It was surrounded with thick bushes, but there was one place which the stags had trampled down, and Elise passed through the opening to the water side. It was so transparent that had not the branches been moved by the breeze, she must have thought they were painted on the bottom so plainly was every leaf reflected. 
both those on which the sun played and those which were in the shade. When she saw her own face, she was quite frightened. It was so brown and ugly. But when she wet her little hand and rubbed her eyes and forehead, her white skin shone through again. Then she took off all her clothes and went into the fresh water. A more beautiful royal child than she could not be found in all the world. When she put on her clothes again and plaited her long hair, she went to the sparkling spring and drank some of the water out of the hollow of her hand. When she wandered further into the wood, though where she was going she had not the least idea, she thought of her brothers, and she thought of a merciful God who would not forsake her. He let the wild crab apples grow to feed the hungry. He showed her a tree, the branches of which were bending beneath the weight of fruit. Here she made her midday meal, and having put props under the branches, she walked on into the thickest part of the forest. It was so quiet that she heard her own footsteps. She heard every little withered leaf which bent under her feet. Not a bird was to be seen. Not a ray of sunlight pierced the leafy branches. And the tall trunks were so close together that when she looked before her, it seemed as if a thick fence of heavy beams hemmed her in on every side. The solitude was such as she had never known before. It was a very dark night. Not a single glowworm sparkled in the marsh. Sadly, she lay down to sleep, and it seemed to her as if the branches above her parted asunder, and the Savior looked down upon her with his loving eyes, and little angels' heads peeped out above his head and under his arms. When she woke in the morning, she was not sure if she had dreamt this, or whether it was really true. She walked a little further when she met an old woman with a basket full of berries, of which she gave her some. Elise asked if she had seen eleven princes ride through the wood. No, said the old woman, but yesterday I saw eleven swans with golden crowns upon their head swimming in the stream close by there. She led Elise a little further to a slope, at the foot of which the stream meandered. The trees on either bank stretched out their rich, leafy branches toward each other, and where from their natural growth they could not reach each other. They had torn their roots out of the ground and leant over the water so as to interlace their branches. Elise said good-bye to the old woman, and walked along the river till it flowed out into a great open sea. The beautiful open sea lay before the maiden, but not a sail was to be seen on it, not a single boat. How was she ever to get any further? She looked at the numberless little pebbles on the beach. They were all worn quite round by the water. Glass, iron, stone, whatever was washed up, had taken their shapes from the water which yet was much softer than her little hand. With all its rolling, it is untiring, and everything hard is smoothed down. I will be just as untiring. Thank you for your lesson, you clear rolling waves. Sometime, so my heart tells me, you will bear me, my beloved brothers. Eleven white swan's feathers were lying on the seaweed, she picked them up and made a bunch of them. There were still drops of water on them. Whether these were dew or tears, no one could tell. It was very lonely there by the shore, but she did not feel it, for the sea was ever-changing. There were more changes on it in the course of a few hours than could be seen on an inland freshwater lake in a year. If a big black cloud arose, it was as if the sea wanted to say, I can look black, too. And then the wind blew up and the waves showed their white crests. But if the clouds were red and the wind dropped, the sea looked like a rose leaf, now white, now green. But however still it was, 
There was always a little gentle motion just by the shore. The water rose and fell softly like the bosom of a sleeping child. When the sun was just about to go down, Elise saw eleven wild swans with golden crowns upon their heads flying toward the shore. They flew in a swaying line, one behind the other, like a white ribbon streamer. Elise climbed up onto the bank and hid behind a bush. The swans settled close by her and flapped their great white wings. As soon as the sun had sunk beneath the water, the swans shed their feathers and became eleven handsome princes. <gasps> they were Elise's brothers. Although they had altered a good deal, she knew them at once. She felt that they must be her brothers, and she sprang into their arms, calling them by name. They were delighted when they recognized their little sister who had grown so big and beautiful. They laughed and cried and told each other how wickedly their stepmother had treated them all. We brothers, said the eldest, have to fly about in the guise of swans as long as the sun is above the horizon. When it goes down, we regain our human shapes. So we always have to look out for a resting place near sunset, for should we happen to be flying up among the clouds when the sun goes down, we should be hurtled to the depths below. We do not live here. There is another land, just as beautiful as this, beyond the sea. But the way to it is very long, and we have to cross the mighty ocean to get to it. There is not a single island on the way where we can spend the night, only one solitary little rock juts up above the waterway it is only just big enough for us to stand upon close together and if there is a heavy sea the water splashes over us yet we thank our god for it we stay there overnight in our human forms and without it we could never revisit our beloved fatherland for our flights take two of the longest days in the year we are permitted to visit the homeland of our fathers once a year, and we dare only stay for eleven days. We hover over this big forest from whence we catch a glimpse of the palace where we were born and where our father lives. Beyond it, we can see the high church towers where our mother is buried. We fancy that the trees and bushes here are related to us, and the wild horses gallop over the moors as we used to see them in our childhood the charcoal burners still sing the old songs we used to dance to when we were children this is our fatherland we are drawn towards it and here we have found you again dear little sister we may stay here two days longer but then we must fly away again across the ocean to a lovely country indeed but it is not our own dear fatherland. How shall we ever take you with us? We have neither ship nor boat. How can I deliver you? said their sister, and they went on talking to each other nearly all night. They only dozed for a few hours. Elise was awakened in the morning by a rustling of swan's wings above her. Her brothers were again transformed, and were wheeling round in great circles, till she lost sight of them in the distance. One of them, the youngest, stayed behind and laid his head against her bosom, and she caressed it with her fingers. They remained together all day. Towards evening the others came back, and as soon as the scent went down, they took their natural forms. Tomorrow we must fly away, and we dare not come back for a whole year. But we can't leave you like this. Have you the courage to go with us? My arm is strong enough to carry you over the forest, so surely our united strength ought to be sufficient to bear you across the ocean. Oh, yes, take me with you, said Elise. They spent the whole night in weaving a kind of net of elastic bark of the willow bound together with tough rushes. They made it both large and strong. Elise lay down upon it, and when the sun rose and the brothers became swans again, 
they took up the net in their bills and flew high up among the clouds with their precious sister who was fast asleep the sunbeams fell straight onto her face so one of the swans flew over her head so that its broad wings should shade her they were far from the land when elise awoke she thought she must still be dreaming it seemed so strange to be carried through the air so high up above the sea by her side lay a branch of beautiful ripe berries and a bundle of savory roots which her youngest brother had collected for her and for which she gave him a grateful smile she knew it was he who flew above her head shading her from the sun they were so high up that the first ship they saw looked like a gull floating on the water a great cloud came up behind them like a mountain and elise saw the shadows of herself on it and those of the eleven swans looking like giants it was a more beautiful picture than any she had ever seen before but as the sun rose higher the cloud fell behind and the shadow picture disappeared they flew on and on all day like an arrow whizzing through the air but they went slower than usual for now they had their sister to carry a storm came up the night was drawing on elise saw the sun sinking with terror in her heart for the solitary rock was nowhere to be seen the swan seemed to be taking stronger strokes than ever alas she was the cause of their not being able to get on faster as soon as the sun went down they would become men and they would all be hurled into the sea and drowned she prayed to god from the bottom of her heart but still no rock was to be seen black clouds gathered and strong gusts of wind announced a storm the cloud looked like a great threatening leaden wave and the flashes of lightning followed each other rapidly the sun was now at the edge of the sea elise's heart quaked when suddenly the swans shot downward so suddenly that she thought they were falling then they hovered again half of the sun was below the horizon and there for the first time she saw the little rock below which did not look bigger than the head of a seal above the water the sun sank very quickly it was no bigger than a star but her foot touched solid earth the sun went out like the last sparks of a bit of burning paper she saw her brothers stand arm in arm around her but there was only just room enough for them the waves beat upon the rock and washed over them like drenching rain the heaven shone with continuous fire and the thunder rolled peal after peal but the sister and brothers held each other's hands and sang a psalm which gave them comfort and courage the air was pure and still at dawn as soon as the sun rose the swans flew off with elise away from the islet the sea still ran high it looked down where they were as if the white foam on the dark green water were millions of swans floating on the waves when the sun rose higher elise saw before her half floating in the air great masses of ice with shining glaciers on the heights a palace perched midway a mile in length with one bold colonnade built above another beneath them swayed palm trees and gorgeous blossoms as big as mill wheels she asked if this was the land to which she was going but the swans shook their head because what she saw was a mirage the beautiful and ever-changing palace of fata magana no mortal dared enter it elise gazed at it but as she gazed the palace gardens and mountains melted away and in their place stood fifty proud churches with high towers and pointed windows she seemed to hear the notes of the organ but it was the sea she heard when she got close to the seeming churches they changed to a great navy sailing beneath her but it was only the sea mist floating over the waters yes she saw constant changes 
passing before her eyes. And now she saw the real land she was bound to. Beautiful blue mountains rose before her with their cedar woods and palaces. Long before the sun went down, she sat among the hills in front of a big cave covered with delicate green creepers. It looked like a piece of embroidery. Now we shall see what you will dream here tonight, said the youngest brother, as she showed her where she was to sleep. If only I might dream how I could deliver you, she said, and this thought filled her mind entirely. She prayed earnestly to God for his help and even in her sleep she continued her prayer. It seemed to her that she was flying up to Fata Morgana and her castle in the air. The fairy came towards her. She was charming and brilliant, and yet she was very like the old woman who gave her the berries in the wood and told her about the swans with the golden crowns. "'Your brothers can be delivered,' she said. "'But have you the courage and endurance enough for it?' The sea is indeed softer than your hands, and it molds the hardest stones. But it does not feel the pain your fingers will feel. It has no heart, and does not suffer the pain and anguish you must feel. Do you see the stinging nettle I hold in my hand? Many of this kind grow around the cave where you sleep. Only these and the ones which grow in the churchyards may be used. Mark that. Those you may pluck, although they will burn and blister your hands. Crush the nettles with your feet, and you will have flax. And of this, you must weave eleven coats of mail with long sleeves. Throw these over the eleven wild swans, and the charm is broken. But remember that from the moment you begin this work, till it is finished, even if it takes years, you must not utter a word. The first word you say will fall like a murderer's dagger into the hearts of your brothers. Their lives hang on your tongue. Mock this well. She touched her hand at the same moment. It was like burning fire, and woke Elise. It was bright daylight, and close to where she slept lay a nettle like those in her dream. She fell upon her knees with thanks to God and left the cave to begin her work. She seized the horrid nettles with her delicate hands, and they burnt like fire. Great blisters rose on her hands and arms, but she suffered it willingly, if only it would deliver her beloved brothers. She crushed every nettle with her bare feet and twisted it into green flax. When the sun went down and the brothers came back, they were alarmed at finding her mute. They thought it was some new witchcraft exercise by their wicked stepmother. But when they saw her hands, they understood that it was for their sakes. The youngest brother wept and wherever his tears fell, she felt no more pain, and the blisters disappeared. She spent the whole night at her work, for she could not rest until she had delivered her dear brothers. All the following day, while her brothers were away, she sat in solitary, but never had the time flown so fast. One coat of mail was finished, and she began the next. When a hunting horn sounded among the mountains, she was frightened. The sound came nearer, and she heard dogs barking. In terror, she rushed into the cave and tied the nettles she had collected and woven into a bundle upon which she sat. At this moment, a big dog bounded forward from the thicket, and another, and another. They barked loudly and ran backwards and forwards. In a few minutes, all the huntsmen were standing outside the cave and the handsomest of them was the king of the country. He stepped up to Elise. Never had he seen so lovely a girl. How came you here, beautiful child? he said. Elise shook her head. She dare not speak. 
the salvation and the lives of her brother depended upon her silence she hid her hands under her apron so that the king should not see what she suffered come with me he said you cannot stay here if you are as good as you are beautiful i will dress you in silks and velvets put a golden crown upon your head and you shall live with me and have your home in my richest palace then he lifted her upon his horse she wept and wrung her hands but the king said i only think of your happiness you will thank me one day for what i am doing then he darted across the mountains holding her before him on his horse and the huntsman followed when the sun went down the royal city with churches and cupolas lay before them and the king led her into the palace where great fountains played in the marble halls and where walls and ceilings were adorned with paintings but she had no eyes for them she only wept and sorrowed passively she allowed the women to dress her in royal robes to twist pearls into her hair and to draw gloves on to her blistered hands she was dazzlingly lovely as she stood there in all her magnificence the courtiers bent low before her and the king wooed her as his bride although the archbishop shook his head and whispered that he feared the beautiful wood maiden was a witch who had dazzled their eyes and infatuated the king the king refused to listen to him he ordered the music to play the richest foods to be brought and the loveliest girls to dance before her she was led through scented gardens into gorgeous apartments but nothing brought a smile to her lips or into her eyes sorrow sat there like a heritage and a possession for all time last of all the king opened the door of a little chamber close by the room where she was to sleep it was adorned with costly green carpets and was made to exactly resemble the cave where he found her on the floor lay a bundle of flax she had spun from the nettles and from the ceiling hung a shirt of mail which was already finished one of the huntsmen had brought all of these things away as curiosities here you may dream that you are back in your former home said the king here is the work upon which you were engaged in the midst of your splendour it may amuse you to think of those times when elise saw all these things so dear to her heart a smile for the first time played upon her lips and the blood rushed back into her cheeks she thought of the deliverance of her brothers and she kissed the king's hand he pressed her to his heart and ordered all the church bells to ring marriage peals the lovely dumb girl from the woods was to be queen of the country the archbishop whispered evil words into the ear of the king but they did not reach his heart the wedding was to take place and the archbishop himself had to put the crown upon her head in his anger he pressed the golden circlet so tightly upon her head as to give her pain but a heavier circlet pressed upon her heart her grief for her brothers so she thought nothing of the bodily pain her lips were sealed a single word from her mouth would cost her brothers their lives but her eyes were full of love for the good and handsome king who did everything he could to please her every day she grew more and more attached to him and longed to confide in him to tell him her sufferings but dumb she must remain and in silence must bring her labor to completion therefore at night she stole away from his side into her secret chamber which was decorated like a cave and here she knitted one shirt after another when she came to the seventh all her flax was worked up she knew that these nettles which she was to use grew in the churchyard but she had to pluck them herself how was she to get there oh what is the pain in my fingers compared with the anguish of my heart she thought i must venture out 
the good God will not desert me. With as much terror in her heart as if she was doing some evil deed, she stole down one night into the moonlit garden, and through the long alleys out into the silent streets to the churchyard. There she saw, sitting on a gravestone, a group of hideous ghouls, who took off their tattered garments as if they were about to bathe, and then they dug down into the freshly made graves with their skinny fingers, and tore the flesh from the bodies and devoured it. Elise had to pass close by them, and they fixed their evil eyes upon her. But she said a prayer as she passed, picked the stinging nettles, and hurried back to the palace with them. Only one person saw her, but that was the archbishop, who watched while others slept. Surely now all his bad opinions of the queen were justified. All was not as it should be with her. She must be a witch, and therefore she had bewitched the king and all the people. He told the king in the confessional what he had seen and what he feared. When those bad words passed his lips, the pictures of the saints shook their heads as if to say, It is not so. Elise is innocent. The archbishop, however, took it differently, and thought that they were bearing witness against her and shaking their heads at her sin. Two big tears rolled down the king's cheeks, and he went home with doubt in his heart. He pretended to sleep at night, but no quiet sleep came to his eyes. He perceived how Elise got up and went to her private closet. Day by day his face grew darker. Elise saw it, but could not imagine what was the cause of it. It alarmed her. And what was she not already suffering in her heart because of her brother's? Her salt tears ran down upon the royal purple velvet, and they lay upon it like sparkling diamonds, and all who saw their splendor wished to be queen. She had, however, almost reached the end of her labors. Only one shirt of mail was wanting, but again she had no more flax and not a single nettle was left. Once more, for the last time, she must go to the churchyard to pluck a few handfuls. She thought with dread of the solitary walk and the horrible ghouls. But her will was as strong as her trust in God. Elise went, but the king and the archbishop followed her. They saw her disappear within the grated gateway of the churchyard. When they followed, they saw the ghouls sitting on the gravestone, as Elise had seen them before, and the king turned away his head, because he thought she was among them, she whose head this very evening had rested on his breast. The people must judge her, he groaned, and the people judged. Let her be consumed in the glowing flames! She was led away from her beautiful royal apartments, to the dark, damp dungeon, where the wind whistled through the grated window. Instead of velvet and silk, they gave her the bundle of nettles she had gathered to lay her head upon. The hard, burning shirts of mail were to be her covering, but they could have given her nothing more precious. She set to work again, with many prayers to God. Outside her prison the street boys sang derisive songs about her, and not a soul comforted her with a kind word. Towards evening, she heard the rustle of swan's wings close to her window. It was her youngest brother. At last he had found her. He sobbed aloud with joy, although he knew that the coming night might be her last. But then her work was almost done, and her brothers were there. The archbishop came to spend her last hours with her, as he had promised the king. She shook her head at him, and by looks and gestures begged him to leave her. She had only this night in which to finish her work, or else 
all would be wasted, all, her pain, tears, and sleepless nights. The archbishop went away with bitter words against her, but poor Elise knew that she was innocent and went on with her work. The little mice ran about the floor, bringing nettles to her feet, so as to give what help they could. And a thrush sat on the grating of the window, where he sang all night as merrily as he could to keep up her courage. It was still only dawn, and the sun would not rise for an hour when the eleven brothers stood at the gate of the palace, begging to be taken to the king. This could not be done, was the answer, for it was still night. The king was asleep, and no one dared to wake him. All their entreaties and threats were useless. The watch turned out, and even the king himself came to see what was the matter. But just then, the sun rose, and no more brothers were to be seen. Only eleven wild swans hovering over the palace. The whole populace streamed out of the town gates. They were all anxious to see the witch burnt. A miserable horse drew the cart in which Elise was seated. They had put upon her a smock of green sacking, and all her beautiful long hair hung loose from the lovely head. Her cheeks were deathly pale, and her lips moved softly while her fingers unceasingly twisted the green yarn. Even on the way to her death, she could not abandon her unfinished work. Ten shirts lay completed at her feet. She labored away at the eleventh, amid the scoffing insults of the populace. Look at that witch, how she mutters! She has never a book of psalms in her hands, no! There she sits with her loathsome sorcery. Tear it away from her into a thousand bits. The crowd pressed around her to destroy her work, but just then eleven white swans flew down and perched upon the cart, flapping their wings. The crowd gave way before them in terror. It is a sign from heaven. She is innocent, they whispered but they dared not say it aloud. The executioner seized her by the hand, but she hastily threw the eleven shirts over the swans, who were immediately transformed into eleven handsome princes. But the youngest had a swan's wing in place of an arm, for one sleeve was wanting to his shirt of mail. She had not been able to finish it. Now I may speak. I am innocent. The populace who saw what had happened bowed down before her as if she had been a saint. But she sank lifeless into her brother's arms. So great had been the strain, the terror, and the suffering she had endured. Yes, innocent she is indeed, said the eldest brother, and he told him all that had happened. Whilst he spoke, a wonderful fragrance spread around, as of millions of roses. Every faggot in the pile had taken root and shot out branches, and a great high hedge of red roses had arisen. At the very top was one pure white blossom. It shone like a star, and the king broke it off and laid it on Elise's bosom and she woke with joy and peace in her heart. All the church bells began to ring on their own accord, and the singing birds flocked around them. Surely such a bridal procession went back to the palace as no king had ever seen before. End of section 5《of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Ann Scott, Ontario, Canada. Fairy Tales 
from hans christian anderson translated by mrs edgar lucas the elf hill some lizards were nimbly running in and out of the clefts in an old tree they understood each other very well for they all spoke lizard language what a rumbling and grumbling is going on inside the old elf hill said one of the lizards i have not closed my eyes for the last two nights for the noise i might just as well be having toothache for all the sleep i get there is something up inside said the other lizard they propped up the top of the hill on four red posts till cockcrow this morning to air it out thoroughly and the elf maidens had been learning some new dancing steps which they are always practising there certainly must be something going on yes i was talking to an earthworm of my acquaintance about it said the third lizard he came straight up out of the hill where he had been boring into the earth for days and nights he had heard a good deal for the miserable creature can't see but it can feel its way and plays the part of eavesdropper to perfection they are expecting visitors in the elf hill grand visitors but who they are the earthworm refused to say or perhaps he did not know all the will-o'-the-wisps are ordered for a procession of torches as it is called and the silver and gold plate of which there is any amount in the hill is all being polished up and put out in the moonlight whoever can the strangers be said all the lizards together what on earth is happening hark what a humming and buzzing at this moment the elf hill opened and an elderly elf maiden tripped out she was hollow behind but otherwise quite attractively dressed she was the old elf king's housekeeper and a distant relative she wore an amber heart upon her forehead she moved her legs at a great pace trip trip good heavens how fast she tripped over the ground she went right down to the night jar in the swamp you are invited to the elf hill for to-night said she to him but will you be so kind as to charge yourself with the other invitations you must make yourself useful in other ways as you don't keep house yourself we are going to have some very distinguished visitors goblins who always have something to say and so the old elf king means to show what he can do who is to be invited asked the night jar well everybody may come to the big ball even human beings if they can only talk in their sleep or do something else after our fashion but the choice is to be strictly limited for the grand feast we will only have the most distinguished people i have had a battle with the elf king about it because i hold that we mustn't even include ghosts the merman and his daughters must be invited first i don't suppose they care much about coming on dry land but i shall see that they each have a whetstone to sit on or something better so I expect they won't decline this time. All the old demons of the first class, with tails, the river god, and the wood sprites, and then I don't think we can pass over the grave pig, the hell horse, and the church grim, although they belong to the clergy, who are not of our people, but that is merely on account of their office, and they are closely connected with us, and visit us very frequently croak said the night jar and he flew off to issue the invitations the elf maidens had already begun to dance and they danced a scarf dance with scarves woven of mist and moonshine these have a lovely effect to those who care for that kind of thing the great hall in the middle of the elf hill had been thoroughly polished up for the occasion the floor was washed with moonshine 
and the walls were rubbed over with witch's fat, and this made them shine with many colors, like a tulip petal. The kitchen was full of frogs on spits, stuffed snake skins, and salads of toadstool spawn, mouse snouts, and hemlock. Then there was beer brewed by the marsh witch, and sparkling saltpeter wine from the vaults everything of the best, and rusty nails and church window panes among the kickshaws. The old elf king had his golden crown polished with pounded slate pencil. Aye, and it was a head boy's slate pencil, too, and they are not so easy to get. They hung up fresh curtains in the bedroom and fixed them with the slime of snails. Yes, indeed. There was a humming and a buzzing. Now we will fumigate with horse hair and pig's bristles, and then I can do no more, said the old elf servant. Dear father, said the youngest of the daughters, are you not going to tell me who these grand strangers are? Well, well, he said, I suppose I must tell you now. Two of my daughters must prepare themselves to be married. Two will certainly make marriages. The old troll chieftain from Norway, that lives on the Dover field among his many rock castles and fastnesses and gold works, which are better than you would expect, is coming down here with his two sons. They are coming to look for wives. The old troll is a regular honest Norwegian veteran, straightforward and merry i used to know him in the olden days when we drank to our good fellowship he came here to fetch a wife but she is dead now she was a daughter of the king of the chalk cliffs at mole as the saying is he took his wife on the chalk biz bought her on tick i am quite anxious to see the old fellow the sons they say are a pair of overgrown ill-mannered cubs but perhaps they are not so bad i dare say they will improve as they grow older see if you can't lick them into shape a bit and when do they come asked one of the daughters that depends upon wind and weather said the elf king they travel economically and they will take their chance of a ship i wanted them to come round by sweden but the old fellow can't bring himself to that yet. He doesn't march with the times, but I don't hold with that. At this moment, two will-of-the-wisp came hopping along, one faster than the other, so of course one arrived before the other. They are coming! They are coming! they cried. Give me my crown, and let me stand in the moonlight, said the elf king. The daughters raised their scarves and curtsied to the ground. There stood the troll chieftain from the Dover field. He wore a crown of hardened icicles and polished fur cones, and besides this he had on a bearskin coat and snowshoes. His sons, on the other hand, had bare necks and wore no braces, because they were strong men. Is that a hill? asked the youngest of the brothers, pointing to the elf hill. We should call it a hole in Norway. Lads, cried the old man, holes go inwards, hills go upwards. Haven't you got eyes in your heads? The only thing that astonished them, they said, was that they understood the language without any trouble. Don't make fools of yourselves, said the old man. One might think you were only half-baked. Then they went into the elf hill, where the company was of the grandest, although they had been got together in such a hurry. You might almost say they had been blown together. It was all charming, and arranged to suit everyone's taste. The merman and his daughters sat at table in great tubs of water, and said it was just like being at home. Everybody had excellent table manners, except the two young Norwegian trolls. They put their feet up on the table, but then they thought anything they did was right. Take your feet out of the way of the dishes, 
said the old troll, and they obeyed him, but not at once. They tickled the ladies they took into dinner with fur combs out of their pockets. Then they pulled off their boots so as to be quite comfortable, and handed the boots to the ladies to hold. Their father, the old troll chieftain, was very different. He told no end of splendid stories about the proud Norwegian mountains and the waterfalls dashing down in white foam with a roar like thunder. He told them about the salmon leaping up against the rushing water when the Nixies played their golden harps. Then he went on to tell them about the sparkling winter nights when the sledge-bells rang and the lads flew over the ice with blazing lights the ice which was so transparent that you could see the startled fish darting away under your feet. Yes, indeed, he could tell stories. You could see and hear the things he described, the sawmills going, the men and maids singing their songs and dancing the merry hauling dance. Hussa! All at once the old troll gave the elf housekeeper a smacking kiss. Such a kiss it was, and yet they were not a bit related. Then the elf maidens had to dance, first plain dancing, and then step dancing, and it was most becoming to them. Then came a fancy dance. Preserve us, how nimble they were on their legs. You couldn't tell where they began or where they ended. You couldn't tell which were arms and which were legs. They were all mixed up together like shavings in a saw pit. They twirled round and round so often that it made the hill horse feel quite giddy and unwell, and he had to leave the table. Purr, said the old troll. There is some life in those legs, but what else can they do besides dancing and pointing their toes in all those really gigs? We will soon show you, said the elf king, and he called out his youngest daughter. She was thin and transparent as moonshine, and was the most ethereal of all the daughters. She put a little white stick in her mouth and vanished instantly. This was her accomplishment. But the troll said he did not like that accomplishment in a wife, nor did he think his boys would appreciate it. The second one, could walk by her own side as if she had a shadow, and no elves have shadows. The third was quite different. She had studied in the Marsh Witch's Brewery, and understood larding alder stumps with glowworms. She will be a good housewife, said the troll, and then he saluted her with his eyes instead of drinking her health, for he did not want to drink too much. Now came the turn of the fourth. She had a big golden harp to play, and when she touched the first string, everybody lifted up their left legs, for all the elfin folk are left legged. But when she touched the second string, everybody had to do what she wished. She is a dangerous woman, said the troll. But both his sons left the hill, for they were tired of it all. And what can the next daughter do? asked the old troll. I have learnt to like the Norwegians, she said, and I shall never marry unless I can go to Norway. But the smallest of the sisters whispered to the troll. That is only because she once heard a song which said that when the world came to an end, the rocks of Norway would still stand, and that is why she wants to go there. She was so afraid of being exterminated. Ha, <laughs> ha, said the troll. So that slipped out. But what can the seventh do? Well, the sixth comes before the seventh, said the elf king, for he could reckon, but she would not come forward. I can only tell people the truth, she said. Nobody cares for me, and I have enough to do in making my winding sheet. Now came the seventh and last. What could she do? Well, she could tell stories as many as ever she liked. Here are my five fingers, said the old troll. Tell me a story for each one. 
the elf maiden took hold of his wrist and he chuckled and laughed till he nearly choked when she came to the fourth finger which had a gold ring on it as if it knew there was to be a betrothal the troll said hold fast what you have got the hand is yours i will have you for a wife myself the elf maiden said that the stories about guldbrand the fourth finger and little peter playman the fifth had not yet been told never mind keep those till winter then you shall tell us about the fir and the birch and the fairy gifts and the tingling frost you shall have every opportunity of telling us stories nobody up there does it yet we will sit in the stone hall where the pine logs blaze and drink mead out of the golden horns of the old norwegian kings the river god gave me a couple when we sit there the mountain sprite comes to pay us a visit and he will sing you the songs of the satyr girls the salmon will leap in the waterfalls and beat against the stone wall but it won't get in ah uh, you may believe me when i say that we lead a merry life there in good old norway but where are the lads yes where were the lads they were running about the fields blowing out the will of the wisps who came so willingly for the torchlight procession why do you gad about out there said the troll i have taken a mother for you now you can come and take one of the ants but the lads said they would rather make a speech and drink toasts they had no wish to marry then they made their speeches and drank toast and tipped their glasses up to show that they had emptied them after that they pulled off their coats and went to sleep on the table to show that they were quite at home but the old troll danced round and round the room with his young bride and exchanged boots with her which was grander than exchanging rings there is the cock crowing said the old housekeeper now we must shut the shutters so that the sun may not burn us up then the hill closed up but the lizards went on running up and down the clefts of the tree and they said to each other ah uh, how much i like the old troll i like the boys better said the earthworm but then it couldn't see poor miserable creature that it was End of section six. Recording by Barbara Ann Scott, Ontario, Canada. Section seven of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Greeby. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas, The Real Princess. There was once a prince, and he wanted a princess, but then she must be a real princess. He travelled right round the world to find one, but there was always something wrong. There were plenty of princesses, but whether they were real princesses he had great difficulty in discovering. There was always something which was not quite right about them. So at last he had to come home again, and he was very sad, because he wanted a real princess so badly. One evening there was a terrible storm. It thundered and lightened, and the rain poured down in torrents. Indeed, it was a fearful night. In the middle of the storm somebody knocked at the town gate, and the old king himself went to open it. It was a princess who stood outside, but she was in a terrible state from the rain and the storm. The water streamed out of her hair and her clothes, it ran in at the top of her shoes and out at the heel, but she said that she was a real princess. "'Well, we shall soon see if that is true,' thought the old queen, but she said nothing. 
She went into the bedroom, took all the bedclothes off, and laid a pea on the bedstead. Then she took twenty mattresses and piled them on the top of the pea, and then twenty feather beds on the top of the mattresses. This was where the princess was to sleep that night. In the morning they asked her how she had slept. "'Oh, terribly badly!' said the princess. "'I have hardly closed my eyes the whole night. Heaven knows what was in the bed. I seem to be lying upon some hard thing, and my whole body is black and blue this morning. It is terrible!' They saw at once that she must be a real princess, when she had felt the pea through twenty mattresses and twenty feather beds. Nobody but a real princess could have such a delicate skin. So the prince took her to be his wife, for now he was sure that he had found a real princess, and the pea was put into the museum, where it may still be seen, if no one has stolen it. Now this is a true story. End of section 7. Recording by Michelle Grebe. Section 8 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cal Taylor. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. A Picture from the Ramparts. It is autumn, and we are standing on the ramparts around the citadel, looking at the ship sailing on the sound, and at the opposite coast of Sweden, which stands out clearly in the evening sunlight. Behind us the ramparts fall away steeply. Around are stately trees from which the golden leaves are falling fast. Down below us, we see some dark and gloomy buildings surrounded with wooden palisades, and inside these, where the sentries are walking up and down, it is darker still, yet not so gloomy as it is behind yon iron grating. That is where the worst convicts are confined. A ray from the setting sun falls into the bare room. The sun shines upon good and bad alike. The gloomy, savage prisoner looks bitterly at the chilly sunbeam. A little bird flutters against the grating. The bird sings to good and bad alike. It twitters softly for a little while, and remains perched, flutters its wings, picks a feather from its breast, and puffs its plumage up. The bad man in chain looks at it. A milder expression steals over his hideous face. A thought which is not quite clear to himself steals into his heart. It is related to the sunshine coming through the grating related to the scent of violets, which in spring grow so thickly outside the window. Now is heard the music of a huntsman's horn, clear and lively. The bird flies away from the grating, the sunbeam disappears, and all is dark again in a narrow cell, dark in the heart of the bad man. Yet the sun has shone into it, and the bird has sung its song. Continue, ye merry notes, the evening is mild, the sea is calm and bright as any mirror. End of section 8 Section 9 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jessica Allen Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Red Shoes There was once a little girl. She was a tiny, delicate little thing, but she always had to go about barefoot in summer, because she was very poor. In winter she had only a pair of heavy wooden shoes, and her ankles were terribly chafed. An old mother shoemaker lived in the middle of the village, and she made a pair of little shoes out of some strips of red cloth. They were very clumsy, but they were made with the best intention, for the little girl was to have them. Her name, Karen. These shoes were given to her, and she wore them for the first time on the day her mother was buried. They were certainly not mourning, but she had no others, and so she walked bare-legged in them behind the poor deal coffin. Just then a big old carriage drove by, and a big old lady was seated in it. 
She looked at the little girl and felt very, very sorry for her, and said to the parson, Give the little girl to me, and I will look after her and be kind to her. Karen thought it was all because of the red shoes, but the old lady said they were hideous, and they were burnt. Karen was well and neatly dressed, and had to learn reading and sewing. People said she was pretty, but her mirror said, You are more than pretty, you are lovely. At this time the Queen was taking a journey through the country, and she had her little daughter, the Princess, with her. The people, and among them Karen, crowded round the palace where they were staying to see them. The little princess stood at a window to show herself. She wore neither a train nor a golden crown, but she was dressed all in white with a beautiful pair of red Morocco shoes. They were indeed a contrast to those the poor old mother shoemaker had made for Karen. Nothing in the world could be compared to these red shoes. The time came when Karen was old enough to be confirmed. She had new clothes and she was also to have a pair of new shoes. The rich shoemaker in the town was to take the measure of her little foot. His shop was full of glass cases of the most charming shoes and shiny leather boots. They looked beautiful, but the old lady could not see very well, so it gave her no pleasure to look at them. Among all the other shoes there was one pair of red shoes like those worn by the princess. Oh, how pretty they were! The shoemaker told them that they had been made for an earl's daughter, but they had not fitted. "'I suppose they are patent leather?' said the old lady. "'They are so shiny.' "'Yes, they do shine,' said Karen, who tried them on. They fitted and were bought. But the old lady had not the least idea that they were red, or she would never have allowed Karen to wear them for her confirmation. This she did, however. Everybody looked at her feet, and when she walked up the church to the chancel, she thought that even the old pictures, those portraits of dead and gone priests and their wives— with stiff collars and long black clothes, fixed their eyes upon her shoes. She thought of nothing else when the priest laid his hand upon her head and spoke to her of holy baptism, the covenant of God, and that from henceforth she was to be a responsible Christian person. The solemn notes of the organ resounded, the children sang with their sweet voices, the old precentor sang, but Karen only thought about her red shoes. By the afternoon the old lady had been told on all sides that the shoes were red, and she said it was very naughty and most improper. For the future, whenever Karen went to the church, she was to wear black shoes, even if they were old. Next Sunday there was Holy Communion, and Karen was to receive it for the first time. She looked at the black shoes and then at the red ones. Then she looked again at the red, and at last put them on. It was beautiful sunny weather, Karen and the old lady went by the path through the cornfield, and it was rather dusty. By the church door stood an old soldier with a crutch. He had a curious long beard. It was more red than white. In fact, it was almost quite red. He bent down to the ground and asked the old lady if he might dust her shoes. Karen put out her little foot too. "'See, what beautiful dancing shoes,' said the soldier. "'Mind you stick fast when you dance.' and as he spoke he struck the souls with his hand. The old lady gave the soldier a copper and went into the church with Karen. All the people in the church looked at Karen's red shoes, and all the portraits looked too. When Karen knelt at the altar rails and the chalice was put to her lips, she only thought of the red shoes. She seemed to see them floating before her eyes. She forgot to join in the hymn of praise, and she forgot to say the Lord's Prayer. Now everybody left the church, and the old lady got into her carriage. Karen lifted her foot to get in after her, but just then the old soldier who was still standing there said, See, what pretty dancing shoes! Karen couldn't help it. She took a few dancing steps, and when she began her feet continued to dance. It was just as if the shoes had power over them. She danced right around the church. She couldn't stop. The coachman had to run after her and take hold of her and lift her into the carriage, but her feet continued to dance, so that she kicked the poor lady horribly. At last they got the shoes off, and her feet had a little rest. When they got home, the shoes were put away in a cupboard, but Karen could not help going to look at them. The old lady became very ill. They said she could not live. She had to be carefully nursed and tended, and no one was nearer than Karen to do this but there was to be a grand ball in the town, and Karen was invited. She looked at the old lady, who after all could not live. She looked at the red shoes. 
She thought there was no harm in doing so. She put on the red shoes, even that she might do. But then she went to the ball and began to dance. The shoes would not let her do what she liked. When she wanted to go to the right, they danced to the left. When she wanted to dance up the room, the shoes danced down the room, then down the stairs, through the streets, and out of the town gate. Away she danced, and away she had to dance, right away into the dark forest. Something shone up above the trees, and she thought it was the moon, for it was a face, but it was the old soldier with the red beard, and he nodded and said, See, what pretty dancing shoes. This frightened her terribly, and she wanted to throw off the red shoes, but they stuck fast. She tore off her stockings, but the shoes had grown fast to her feet, and off she danced, and off she had to dance, over fields and meadows, in rain and sunshine, by day and by night. But at night it was fearful. She danced into the open churchyard, but the dead did not join her dance. They had something much better to do. She wanted to sit down on a pauper's grave where the bitter wormwood grew, but there was no rest nor repose for her. When she danced towards the open church door, she saw an angel standing there in long white robes and wings which reached from his shoulders to the ground. His face was grave and stern, and in his hand he held a broad and shining sword. "'Dance you shall,' said he. "'You shall dance in your red shoes till you are pale and cold, till your skin shrivels up and you are a skeleton. You shall dance from door to door, and wherever you find proud, vain children, you must knock at the door so that they may see you and fear you. Yea, you shall dance. Mercy! shrieked Karen, but she did not hear the angel's answer, for the shoes bore her through the gate into the fields over roadways and paths. Ever and ever she was forced to dance. One morning she danced past a door she knew well. She heard the sound of a hymn from within, and a coffin covered with flowers was being carried out. Then she knew that the old lady was dead, and it seemed to her that she was forsaken by all the world, and cursed by the holy angels of God. On and ever on she danced, danced she must, even through the dark nights. The shoes bore her away over briars and stubble, till her feet were torn and bleeding. She danced away over the heath till she came to a little lonely house. She knew the executioner lived here, and she tapped with her fingers on the window pane, and said, "'Come out! Come out! I can't come in, for I am dancing!' The executioner said, "'You can't know who I am. I chop the bad people's heads off, and I see that my axe is quivering.' "'Don't chop my head off,' said Karen, "'for then I can never repent of my sins. But pray, pray, chop my feet off with the red shoes!' Then she confessed all her sins, and the executioner chopped off her feet with the red shoes, but the shoes danced right away with the little feet into the depths of the forest. Then he made her a pair of wooden legs and crutches, and he taught her a psalm, the one penitents always sing. And she kissed the hand which had wielded the axe, and went away over the heath. "'I have suffered enough for those red shoes,' said she. "'I will go to church now so that they may see me.' And she went as fast as she could to the church door, when she got there, the red shoes danced up in front of her, and she was frightened and went home again. She was very sad all the week and shed many bitter tears, but when Sunday came, she said, Now then, I have suffered and struggled long enough. I should think I am quite as good as many who sit holding their heads so high in church. She went along quite boldly, but she did not get further than the gate before she saw the red shoes dancing in front of her. She was more frightened than ever and turned back, this time with real repentance in her heart. Then she went to the parson's house and begged to be taken into service. She would be very industrious and work as hard as she could. She didn't care what wages they gave her, if only she might have a roof over her head and live among kind people. The parson's wife was sorry for her and took her into her service. She proved to be very industrious and thoughtful. She sat very still and listened most attentively in the evening when the parson read the Bible. All the little ones were very fond of her, but when they chatted about finery and dress, and about being as beautiful as a queen, she would shake her head. Next Sunday they all went to church, and they asked her if she would go with them, but she looked sadly with tears in her eyes at her crutches, and they went without her to hear the word of God, and she sat in her little room alone. It was only big enough for a bed and a chair. She sat there with her prayer book in her hand. 
and as she read it with a humble mind, she heard the notes of the organ, borne from the church by the wind. She raised her tear-stained face and said, Oh, God, help me! Then the sun shone brightly round her, and the angel in the white robes whom she had seen on yonder night at the church door stood before her. He no longer held the sharp sword in his hand, but a beautiful green branch covered with roses. He touched the ceiling with it, and it rose to a great height, and wherever he touched it a golden star appeared. Then he touched the walls, and they spread themselves out, and she saw and heard the organ. She saw the pictures of the old parsons and their wives. The congregation were all sitting in their seats, singing aloud, for the church itself had come home to the poor girl in her narrow little chamber, or else she had been taken to it. She found herself on the bench with the other people from the parsonage, and when the hymn had come to an end they looked up and nodded to her and said, "'It was a good thing you came after all, little Karen.' "'It was through God's mercy,' she said. The organ sounded, and the children's voices echoed so sweetly through the choir. The warm sunshine streamed brightly in through the window, right up to the bench where Karen sat. Her heart was so overfilled with the sunshine, with peace and with joy, that it broke. Her soul flew with the sunshine to heaven, and no one there asked about the red shoes. End of section 9「Section 10 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Sounds. Boston. Sarah Sounds Communications.com. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Thumbelisa. There was once a woman who had the greatest longing for a little tiny child, but she had no idea where to get one. So she went to an old witch and said to her, I do so long to have a little child. Will you tell me where I can get one? Oh, we shall be able to manage that, said the witch. Here is a barley corn for you. It is not at all the same kind as that which grows in the peasant's field or with which chickens are fed. Plant it in a flower pot and you will see what will appear. Thank you, oh, thank you, said the woman. And she gave the witch twelve pennies then went home and planted the barley corn, and a large, handsome flower sprang up at once. It looked exactly like a tulip, but the petals were tightly shut up, just as if they were still in bud. That is a lovely flower, said the woman, and she kissed the pretty red and yellow petals. As she kissed it, the flower burst open with a loud snap. It was a real tulip, you can see that, but right in the middle of the flower, on the green stool sat a little tiny girl, most lovely and delicate. She was not more than an inch in height, so she was called Thumbelisa. Her cradle was a smartly varnished walnut shell with the blue petals of violets for a mattress and a rose leaf to cover her. She slept in it at night, but during the day she played about on the table where the woman had placed a plate surrounded by a wreath of flowers on the outer edge with their stalks in water. A large tulip petal floated on the water, and on this little Thumbelisa sat and sailed about from one side of the plate to the other. She had two white horsehairs for oars. It was a pretty sight. She could sing, too, with such delicacy and charm as was never heard before. One night, as she lay in her pretty bed, a great ugly toad hopped in at the window, for there was a broken pane. Ugh, how hideous that great wet toad was! It hopped right down on the table where Thumbelisa lay fast asleep under the red rose leaf. Here is a lovely wife for my son! 
said the toad, and then she took up the walnut shell where Thumbelisa slept and hopped away with it through the window down into the garden. A great broad stream ran through it, but just at the edge it was swampy and muddy, and it was here that the toad lived with her son. Ugh, how ugly and hideous he was, too, exactly like his mother. Quax, quax, brick-tick-tick-tacks. That was all he had to say when he saw the lovely little girl in the walnut shell. Do not talk so loud, or you will wake her, said the old toad. She might escape us yet, for she is as light as thistledown. We will put her on one of the broad water lily leaves out in the stream. It will be just like an island to her. She is so small and light. She won't be able to run away from there while we get the state room ready down under the mud, which you are to inhabit. A great many water lilies grew in the stream. Their broad green leaves looked as if they were floating on the surface of the water. The leaf, which was furthest from the shore, was also the biggest, and to this one the old toad swam out with the walnut shell in which little Thumbelisa lay. The poor tiny creature woke up quite early in the morning, and when she saw where she was she began to cry most bitterly, for there was water on every side of the big green leaf, and she could not reach the land at any point. The old toad sat in the mud decking out her abode with grasses and the buds of the yellow water lilies so as to have it very nice for her new daughter-in-law. And then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf where Thumbelisa stood. They wanted to fetch her pretty bed to place it in the bridal chamber before they took her there. The old toad made a deep curtsy in the water before her and said, Here is my son who is to be your husband, and you are to live together most comfortably down in the mud. Coax, coax, brick was all the son could say. Then they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. But Thumbelisa sat quite alone on the green leaf and cried, because she did not want to live with the ugly toad or have her horrid son for a husband. The little fish, which swam about in the water, had no doubt seen the toad and heard what she said, so they stuck their heads up, wishing, I suppose, to see the little girl. As soon as they saw her, they were delighted with her and were quite grieved to think that she was to go down to live with the ugly toad. No, that should never happen. They flocked together down in the water, round about the green stem which held the leaf she stood upon, and gnawed at it with their teeth till it floated away down the stream, carrying Thumbelisa away where the toad could not follow her. Thumbelisa sailed past place after place, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little maid! The leaf with her on it floated further and further away, and in this manner reached foreign lands. A pretty little white butterfly fluttered round and round her for some time and at last settled on the leaf, for it had taken quite a fancy to Thumbelisa. She was so happy now, because the toad could not reach her and she was sailing through such lovely scenes. The sun shone on the water and it looked like liquid gold. Then she took her sash and tied one end round the butterfly and the other she made fast to the leaf, which went gliding on quicker and quicker, and she with it, for she was standing on the leaf. At this moment a big cockchafer came flying along. He caught sight of her, and in an instant he fixed his claw round her slender waist and flew off with her up into a tree, but the green leaf floated down the stream, and the butterfly with it, for he was tied to it, and could not get loose. Heavens, how frightened poor little Thumbelisa was when the cockchafer carried her up into the tree, but she was most of all grieved about the pretty white butterfly which she had fastened to the leaf. If he could not succeed in getting loose, he would be starved to death. 
but the cockchafer cared nothing for that. He settled with her on the largest leaf on the tree and fed her with honey from the flowers, and he said that she was lovely, although she was not a bit like a chafer. Presently, all the other chafers which lived in the tree came to visit them. They looked at Thumbelisa, and the young lady chafers twitched their feelers and said, She has also got two legs. What a good effect it has. She has no feelers, said another. She is so slender in the waist. Fie, she looks like a human being. How ugly she is, said all the mother chafers, and yet little Thumbelisa was so pretty. That was certainly also the opinion of the cockchafer who had captured her. But when all the others said she was ugly, he at last began to believe it too, and would not have anything more to do with her. She might go wherever she liked. They flew down from the tree with her and placed her on a daisy, where she cried because she was so ugly that the chafers would have nothing to do with her. And after all, she was more beautiful than anything you could imagine, as delicate and transparent as the finest rose leaf. Poor little Thumbelisa lived all the summer quite alone in the wood. She plaited a bed of grass for herself and hung it up under a big dock leaf which sheltered her from the rain. She sucked the honey from the flowers for her food, and her drink was the dew which lay on the leaves in the morning. In this way, the summer and autumn passed, but then came the winter. All the birds which used to swing so sweetly to her flew away. The great dock leaf under which she had lived shriveled up, leaving nothing but a dead yellow stalk, and she shivered with the cold, for her clothes were worn out. She was such a tiny creature. Poor little Thumbelisa. She certainly must be frozen to death. It began to snow, and every snowflake which fell upon her was like a whole shovelful upon one of us. For we are big, and she was only one inch in height. Then she wrapped herself up in a withered leaf, but that did not warm her much. She trembled with the cold. Close to the wood in which she had been living lay a large cornfield, but the corn had long ago been carried away and nothing remained but the bare, dry stubble which stood up out of the frozen ground. The stubble was quite a forest for her to walk about in. Oh, how she shook with the cold! Then she came to the door of a field mouse's home. It was a little hole down under the stubble, the field mouse lived so cozily and warm there. Her whole room was full of corn, and she had a beautiful kitchen and larder besides. Poor Thumbelisa stood just inside the door like any other poor beggar child and begged for a little piece of barley corn, for she had had nothing to eat for two whole days. "'You poor little thing,' said the field mouse, for she was, at bottom, a good old field mouse. Come into my warm room and dine with me. Then, as she took a fancy to Thumbelisa, she said, You may with pleasure stay with me for the winter, but you must keep my room clean and tidy and tell me stories, for I am very fond of them. And Thumbelisa did what the good old field mouse desired, and was on the whole very comfortable. Now we shall soon have a visitor said the field mouse. My neighbor generally comes to see me every weekday. He is even better housed than I am. His rooms are very large, and he wears a most beautiful black velvet coat. If only you could get him for a husband, you would indeed be well settled. But he can't see. You must tell him all the most beautiful stories you know. But Thumbelisa did not like this and she would have nothing to say to the neighbor, for he was a mole. He came and paid a visit in his black velvet coat. He was very rich and wise, said the field mouse, and his home was twenty times as large as hers, and he had much learning, but he did not like the sun or the beautiful flowers. In fact, he spoke slightingly of them, for he had never seen them. Thumbelisa had to sing to him, and she sang both Fly away, cockchafer, and a monk he wandered through the meadow. And then the mole 
fell in love with her because of her sweet voice. But he did not say anything, for he was of a discreet turn of mind. He had just made a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and he gave the field mouse and Thumbelisa leave to walk in it whenever they liked. He told them not to be afraid of the dead bird which was lying in the passage. It was a whole bird with feathers and beak which had probably died quite recently at the beginning of the winter, and was now entombed just where he had made his tunnel. The mole took a piece of tinderwood in his mouth, for that shines like fire in the dark, and walked in front of them to light them in the long dark passage. When they came to the place where the dead bird lay, the mole thrust his broad nose up to the roof and pushed the earth up so as to make a big hole through which the daylight shone. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, with its pretty wings closely pressed to its sides, and the legs and head drawn in under the feathers. No doubt the poor bird had died of cold. Thumbelisa was so sorry for it. She loved all the little birds, for they had twittered and sung so sweetly to her during the whole summer. But the mole kicked it with his short legs and said, Now it will pipe no more. It must be a miserable fate to be born a little bird. Thank heaven no child of mine can be a bird. A bird like that has nothing but its twitter and dies of hunger in the winter. Yes, a sensible man, you may well say that, said the field mouse. What has a bird for all its twittering when the cold weather comes? It has to hunger and freeze, but then it must cut a dash. Thumbelisa did not say anything, but when the others turned their backs to the bird, she stooped down and stroked aside the feathers which lay over its head and kissed its closed eyes. Perhaps it was this very bird which sang so sweetly to me in the summer, she thought. What pleasure it gave me, the dear, pretty bird. The mole now closed up the hole which led in the daylight and conducted the ladies to their home. Thumbelisa could not sleep at all in the night, so she had got up out of her bed and plaited a large, handsome mat of hay, and then she carried it down and spread it all over the dead bird, and laid some soft cotton wool which she had found in the field mouse's room close round its sides, so that it might have a warm bed on the cold ground. Goodbye, you sweet little bird, said she. Goodbye, and thank you for your sweet song through the summer, when all the trees were green and the sun shone warmly upon us. Then she laid her head close up to the bird's breast, but was quite startled at a sound, as if something was thumping inside it. It was the bird's heart. It was not dead, but lay in a swoon, and now that it had been warmed, it began to revive. In the autumn, all the swallows fly away to warm countries, but if one happens to be belated, feels the cold so much that it falls down like a dead thing, and remains lying where it falls till the snow covers it up, Thumbelisa quite shook with fright, for the bird was very, very big beside her, who was only one inch high. But she gathered up her courage, packed the wool closer round the poor bird, and fetched a leaf of mint, which she had herself for a coverlet, and laid it over the bird's head. The next night she stole down again to it and found it alive, but so feeble that it could only just open its eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelisa, who stood with a bit of tinderwood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. "'Many, many thanks, you sweet child,' said the sick swallow to her. "'You have warmed me beautifully. "'I shall soon have strength to fly out into the warm sun again.' "'Oh,' said she, "'it is so cold outside. "'It snows and freezes. "'Stay in your warm bed. "'I will tend you.' "'Then... She brought water to the swallow in a leaf, and when it had drunk some, it told her how it had torn its wing on a blackthorn bush, and therefore 
could not fly as fast as the other swallows which were taking flight then for the distant warm lands. At last it fell down on the ground, but after that it remembered nothing, and did not in the least know how it had got into the tunnel. It stayed there all the winter, and Thumbelisa was good to it, and grew very fond of it. She did not tell either the mole or the field mouse anything about it, for they did not like the poor unfortunate swallow. As soon as the spring came, and the warmth of the sun penetrated the ground, the swallow said good-bye to Thumbelisa, who opened the hole which the mole had made above. The sun streamed in deliciously upon them, and the swallow asked if she would not go with him. She could sit upon his back, and they would fly far away into the green wood. But Thumbelisa knew that it would grieve the old field mouse if she left her like that. No, I can't, said Thumbelisa. Goodbye, goodbye, then, you kind, pretty girl, said the swallow, and flew out into the sunshine. Thumbelisa looked after him, and her eyes filled with tears, for she was very fond of the poor swallow. Tweet, tweet, sang the bird, and flew into the green wood. Thumbelisa was very sad. She was not allowed to go into the warm sunshine at all. The corn, which was sown in the field near the field mouse's house, grew quite long. It was a thick forest for the poor little girl, who was only an inch high. "'You must work at your trousseau this summer,' said the mouse to her, for their neighbor, the tiresome mole in his black velvet coat, had asked her to marry him. "'You shall have both woolen and linen. You shall have wherewith to clothe and cover yourself when you become the mole's wife.' Thumbelisa had to turn to the distaff, and the field mouse hired four spiders to spin and weave day and night. The mole paid a visit every evening, and he was always saying that when the summer came to an end, the sun would not shine nearly so warmly. Now it burnt the ground as hard as a stone. Yes, when the summer was over, he would celebrate his marriage. But Thumbelisa was not at all pleased for she did not care a bit for the tiresome mole. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, she used to steal out to the door, and when the wind blew aside the tops of the cornstalks so that she could see the blue sky, she thought how bright and lovely it was out there and wished so much to see the dear swallow again. But it never came back. No doubt it was a long way off, flying about in the beautiful green woods. When the autumn came, all Thumbelisa's outfit was ready. In four weeks you must be married, said the field mouse to her. But Thumbelisa cried and said she would not have the tiresome mole for a husband. Fiddle dee dee, said the field mouse. Don't be obstinate or I shall bite you with my white tooth. You are going to have a splendid husband. The queen herself hasn't the equal of his black velvet coat. Both his kitchen and cellar are full. You should thank heaven for such a husband. So they were to be married. The mole had come to fetch Thumbelisa. She was to live deep down under the ground with him and never to go out into the warm sunshine, for he could not bear it. The poor child was very sad at the thought of bidding goodbye to the beautiful sun. While she had been with the field mouse, she had at least been allowed to look at it from the door. Goodbye, you bright sun, she said, as she stretched out her arms towards it and went a little way outside the field mouse's house, for now the harvest was over, and only the stubble remained. Goodbye, goodbye, she said and threw her tiny arms round a little red flower growing there. Give my love to the dear swallow if you happen to see him. Tweet, tweet, she heard at this moment above her head. She looked up. It was the swallow just passing. As soon as it saw Thumbelisa, it was delighted. She told it how unwilling she was to have the ugly mole for a husband, and that she was to live deep down underground, where the sun never shone. She could not help crying about it. The cold winter is coming, said the swallow. 
and I am going to fly away to warm countries. Will you go with me? You can sit upon my back. Tie yourself on with your sash. Then we will fly away from the ugly mole and his dark cavern, far away over the mountains to those warm countries where the sun shines with greater splendor than here, where it is always summer and there are heaps of flowers. Do fly with me, you sweet little Thumbelisa, who saved my life when I lay frozen in the dark, earthy passage. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelisa, seating herself on the bird's back with her feet on its outspread wing. She tied her band tightly to one of the strongest feathers, and then the swallow flew away. High up in the air above forests and lakes, high up above the biggest mountains where the snow never melts, and Thumbelisa shivered in the cold air, but then she crept under the bird's warm feathers and only stuck out her little head to look at the beautiful sights beneath her. Then at last they reached the warm countries. The sun shone with a warmer glow than here. The sky was twice as high, and the most beautiful green and blue grapes grew in clusters on the banks and hedgerows. Oranges and lemons hung in the woods, which were fragrant with myrtles and sweet herbs, and the beautiful children ran about the roads, playing with the large, gorgeously colored butterflies. But the swallow flew on and on, and the country grew more and more beautiful. Under magnificent green trees on the shores of the blue sea stood a dazzling white marble palace of ancient date. Vines wreathed themselves round the stately pillars. At the head of these there were countless nests, and the swallow who carried Thumbelisa lived in one of them. Here is my house, said the swallow. But if you will choose one of the gorgeous flowers growing down there, I will place you in it, and you will live as happily as you can wish. That would be delightful, she said, and clapped her little hands. A great white marble column had fallen to the ground, and lay there broken in three pieces, but between these the most lovely white flowers grew. The swallow flew down with Thumbelisa and put her upon one of the broad leaves. What was her astonishment to find a little man in the middle of the flower? as bright and transparent as if he had been made of glass. He had a lovely golden crown upon his head and the most beautiful bright wings upon his shoulders. He was no bigger than Thumbelisa. He was the angel of the flowers. There was a similar little man or woman in every flower, but he was the king of them all. Heavens! How beautiful he is, whispered Thumbelisa to the swallow. The little prince was quite frightened by the swallow, for it was a perfect giant of a bird to him, he who was so small and delicate. But when he saw Thumbelisa, he was delighted. She was the very prettiest girl he had ever seen. He therefore took the golden crown off his own head and placed it on hers, and asked her name, and if she would be his wife, and then she would be queen of the flowers. Yes, he was certainly a very different kind of husband from the toad's son, or the mole with his black velvet coat. So she accepted the beautiful prince, and out of every flower stepped a little lady or a gentleman so lovely that it was a pleasure to look at them. Each one brought a gift to Thumbelisa, but the best of all was a pair of pretty wings from a large white fly. They were fastened onto her back, and then she too could fly from flower to flower. All was then delight and happiness, but the swallow sat alone in his nest and sang to them as well as he could, for his heart was heavy. He was so fond of Thumbelisa himself and would have wished never to part from her.
You shall not be called Thumbelisa, said the angel of the flower to her. That is such an ugly name, and you are so pretty. We will call you May. Goodbye, goodbye, said the swallow, and flew away again from the warm countries, far away back to Denmark. There he had a little nest above the window, where the man lived who wrote this story, and he sang his tweet-tweet to the man, and so we have the whole story. End of section 10. Recording by Sarah Sounds, Boston. SarahSoundsCommunications.com Section 11 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Goblin and the Huckster. There was once a real student who lived in an attic and possessed nothing at all. There was also a real huckster who lived on the ground floor and owned the whole house. The goblin made friends with him, for every Christmas he was given a plateful of porridge and a lump of butter in it. The huckster could very well afford this, so the goblin stayed in the shop, which was a very instructive place. One evening the student came in by the back door to buy himself some candles and cheese. He had no one to send, so he went himself. He got what he asked for and paid for it, and the huckster nodded to him and said good evening to him, and his wife did the same. She was a woman who could do more than nod. She had the gift of gab. The student returned the nod and then remained standing, buried in something he found printed on the paper in which the cheese was wrapped. It was a page torn out of an old book, which ought never to have been torn up at all. It was an old book of poetry. "'There's more of it lying there,' said the huckster. "'I gave a few coffee beans to an old woman for it. If you'll give me two pence, you may have the rest of it.' "'Thank you,' said the student. "'Let me have it instead of the cheese. I can eat plain bread and butter just as well. It'd be a sin if the whole of that book were to be torn to bits. You are a capital fellow and a practical man, but you know no more about poetry than that tub.' Now, this was a very rude speech, especially to the tub. But the huckster laughed. Of course it was said as a kind of joke. But the goblin was much annoyed that anyone dared to say such a thing to a huckster who was a landlord and who sold the best butter. At night, when the shop was shut and everybody in bed except the student, the goblin went in and stole the good wife's long tongue, which she had no use for when she was asleep. On whatever object in the room he laid this article, it conferred the power of speech. And whatever the object, it became able to express its thoughts and feelings as glibly as the good wife herself. But only one could have it at a time, and this was a very good thing, or they would all have been talking at once. The goblin laid the tongue down upon the tub which contained the old newspapers. Is it really true? asked he, that you do not know what poetry is. Of course I know, said the tub. It is the kind of stuff which is printed at the foot of the newspaper columns and is sometimes cut out. I imagine that I have more of it within me than the student has, and after all, I am only a poor tub compared to the huckster. Then the goblin put the tongue upon the coffee mill, and what a pace it went at! He also put it on the butter cask and the cash box. They were all of the same opinions as the tub, and what the majority agree upon must be respected. "'Now the student shall have it,' said the goblin, and he stole silently up the back stairs to the attic where the student lived. There was a light burning, and the goblin peeped through the keyhole and saw that the student was reading the tattered book from downstairs. 
but how bright the room was a clear ray of light shot forth from the book which widened out to a stem and then to a mighty tree which rose and spread its branches right over the student the leaves were delightfully fresh and every flower was like a lovely girl's face some with dark and sparkling eyes while others were wonderfully blue and clear every fruit was a shining star and the air was filled with music no the little goblin had never imagined much less seen or taken part in such splendors so then he stood on tiptoe peeping and peeping till the light was put out the student blew out his lamp and went to bed but the little goblin remained by the door for the sweet songs still echoed through the air making a charming lullaby for the student who was taking his rest this is splendid said the goblin i hadn't expected anything of the kind i think i'll stay with the student and he thought and thought again and then he sighed but the student has no porridge then he went away yes he went back to the huckster and it was a good thing he went for the tub had almost used up the good wife's volubility he had given a description of all he contained from one side and now he was just about to turn himself over to repeat the same from the other side when the goblin came and took away the lady's tongue to return to her but the whole shop from the cash drawer to the firewood took their opinions from the tub from that time and they respected it so highly and confided in it to such a degree that when the huckster afterwards read the art and theatrical announcements in his times the evening one they all thought that they came from the tub but the little goblin no longer sat quietly listening to all the wisdom and learning downstairs no as soon as a light appeared in the attic it had the same effect upon him as if the rays of light had been stout anchor hawsers for they drew him upwards and forced him to go and peep through the keyhole a mighty power surged around him such as we feel when the almighty moves over the face of the rolling waters in a storm and he burst into tears he did not himself know wherefore but there was something soothing in these tears how splendid it must be to sit with the student under that tree the tree of knowledge but that might not be he was glad even to stand at the keyhole he still came to peep through the keyhole when the autumn winds blew down upon it from the trap door it was cold very cold but the little creature did not feel it till the light went out in the attic and the sounds died away on the wind then how he shivered he crept down again to his cozy corner it was warm and comfortable there and when the christmas porridge appeared with a lump of butter in it why then the huckster was master but in the middle of the night the goblin was roused up by a frightful uproar and banging on the window shutters the people outside were thundering on them the watchman was blowing his whistle there was a great fire the whole street was lighted up was it in this house or the next where it was terrible the huckster's wife was so upset that she took the gold earrings out of her ears and put them into her pocket so as at least to save something the huckster ran to look for his bonds and the maid-servant for the silk mantle she had just managed to afford herself everybody wanted to save the most precious thing he had and the goblin wanted to do the same so with a hop and a skip he was up the stairs and into the student's room the student stood calmly at the window looking at the fire which was in the opposite house the little goblin seized the marvelous book which was lying on the table stuffed it into his cap and held it with both his hands the greatest treasure in the house was saved then he rushed away right out on to the roof to the very top of the chimney and there he sat lighted up by the blaze opposite he still held his red cap tightly grasped with both hands in which the treasure was hidden now he knew the leaning of his heart and to whom he really belonged 
But when the fire was out, and he thought the matter over, why then? I will divide myself between them, he said. I can't give up the hugster because of the porridge. In this he was quite human. We others go to the huckster, too, for the porridge. End of section 11